Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for uh, having me on tonight, Anne and Sawmel. Um, as she said, my name is Alyssa Johnson, and I am a environmental educator at the Montezuma Audubon Center in Savannah, New York. Um, I use the pronouns she, her, and hers. Uh, and I have a, a diverse professional career background, uh, as well as, you know, sometimes people are interested to know, like, how, how do you, what do you study when you go to school to become an environmental educator? My background is mostly in wildlife biology and management. Uh, there are environmental ed and interpretation programs that you can pursue, but uh, I always wanted to be a biologist when I grew up. And then in college, I discovered a, a knack and an interest with educating the public. Um, and so I've kind of pursued that, that path in, in the field. Gotten to do a lot of really cool stuff from being in Alaska, working with lake trout and migrating salmon. Um, I've handled tons of different kinds of birds. I've done black bear work. Um, there's, that's Addie and I. Uh, Addie is short for Adirondack. That's a picture of us in the Adirondacks. Um, but I've always been very outdoorsy. I grew up learning about birds. My, my dad was always quizzing us, uh, my sister and I. So it was just destiny that I eventually end up working uh, with birds. So the, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to define some things for everybody because the term Montezuma is often confusing. So I work at the Montezuma Audubon Center, and we are part of an IBA, an international, or excuse me, an important bird area. And we were the first to be considered an international important bird area, the entirety Montezuma Wetlands Complex. This is an area that is recognized for the value uh, to bird conservation, whether that be migratory breeding, uh, migratory to visiting, or migratory through, and then of course breeding. So uh, the Montezuma Wetlands Complex, and I will continue to explain what that is, uh, is a very important migratory stopover for waterfowl in particular. This is a view from our observation platform at our property. We are open, uh, we have been open since July 2020 to the public. Uh, the building is open Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4. Uh, and even though the building may be closed, folks are still welcome to come and enjoy the two miles of trails that we have from sunrise to sunset. So the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. Many people are familiar, familiar and I've already heard this in the chat uh, before we got started, but many people are familiar with Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. That is a federal, uh, federally run property uh, ran by the federal agency, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. That is what you see from the thruway when you're driving I-90 between Syracuse and Rochester, that is Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. It is accessible, the, the, their visitor center, and they also have a wildlife drive, a seasonal wildlife drive, that is accessible from routes five and 20 uh, in Seneca Falls. I am located oh, eight-ish miles north in Savannah in Wayne County, and we are the Montezuma Audubon Center. The entire complex is located off the north end of Cayuga Lake, and I do not have time to talk about the glacial history and geology of the area, but we have the glaciers to thank for the vast 50 plus thousand wetlands uh, complex that exists in, in a fraction of what it used to historically. Uh, but that's why it's so wonderful that we have the National Wildlife Refuge as well as state land. So the complex refers to not only the refuge, the federal land, and that is, let me grab a pointer. This over here is Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. Here's the throughway cutting through. This slightly different shade of green, which by the way, we are currently working on editing this map and it's, it's old, it needs to be updated. And I'm going to lobby very hard for different colors to represent because the colors are so close. But this lighter minty color green is state owned land. So New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. They own about between eight and 9,000 acres and the refuge owns between eight and 9,000 acres. So we have thousands of acres of refuge, federal owned land and thousands of acres of state owned land. And here is where the Audubon Center is and our building and property is actually owned by the New York State DEC which is a unique situation. Many Audubon centers and sanctuaries own their own property. 
but we are with a partnership with the DEC and we are basically the tenants and they are the landlords, but it is a great partnership. So I have countless times had conversations with people who are only familiar with Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge or will come into our visitor center and tell me, oh, I just came from the real Montezuma. And I take great offense to this because I'm not a figment of your imagination. Uh, we, our center has been around for 15 years now. We are open year round, whereas the Refuge Visitor Center and Wildlife Drive is not. So there are, there's so much more than just the Wildlife Drive to enjoy in the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. Um, I have to mention our friends of the Montezuma Wetlands Complex. That is, there is a separate 501c3 nonprofit group that supports uh, Audubon, the DEC, and the Refuge through monetary support, uh, physical labor support. That's the, the MARSH uh, graphic there that stands for Montezuma Alliance for Restoration of Species and Habitats. And that is a core group of volunteers that comes out to help uh, remove invasive species to help uh, plant native species, map, do, do different mappings, bird surveys. So without the support that uh, they provide Audubon, the DEC and the refuge, we wouldn't, we wouldn't be nearly as successful as we are. Um, if anyone's ever journeyed upstate and participated in the Montezuma muck race, or if you're interested in that, I can give you more information, but that is an annual 24 hour birding competition, birdathon. Uh, that the friends host, and it's a major fundraiser for uh, the year, and then they help disseminate that information or that that those funds out to us, uh, you know, as as needed for various projects or programs. So I always like to start off with that because, like I said, many people are a bit confused about the term Montezuma. So Anne asked me tonight to give a presentation about Montezuma migration, and it is the perfect time because. We are right on the cusp of migration really kicking off. Already, my phone, my emails, my Facebook messages are starting to fill with, where are the snow geese? <laughs> when are the snow geese going to be getting there? Uh, and I'll talk more about them as we get further in. Tomorrow night, as Ann mentioned, I will be giving a presentation all about snow geese, that is the, the title, um, about their natural history and how to find them, what to look for. Uh, it's not hard. If you find a flock like this, it's not hard to miss them, or it's hard to miss them, but uh, there's some timing that you have to consider when looking for the snow geese. So I took this photo, I think it was this week, four years ago. They were very early. So I love to start with that photo because it's just a, a flurry of activity. So throughout the presentation, I'm going to talk about migration, what it is, uh, why they do it, how they do it, how to observe migration, some ways to reduce threats during uh, migration, who you might see migrating currently, and when and where to look for migratory and non-migratory birds. So a lot of this is going to be focused around the Montezuma Wetlands Complex in Cayuga Lake, uh, but I'm hoping that when I uh, share all of this information with you, it will entice you to come and visit the complex. So the way I like to describe a flyway is a, a bird highway. I, that's how I describe it to kids. And this is an invisible route that run not only north-south, that is often how we think of it, that it's a linear north-south or south-north route, but migration doesn't necessarily have to be, it's not any specific direction. And it's not any specific uh, distance either. This is some uh, migration routes in the Western hemisphere. And this is important because, as I'm sure many of you know, many of our favorite birds are in South America right now or just beginning to start moving north. So our purple martins, uh, some of our warblers, scarlet tanagers, those kinds of birds are enjoying life south of the equator and are going to soon or already <laughs> beginning to swing the pendulum back the other way and come back north. This is a really cool graphic uh, from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. So each dot represents different species and there's lots of science into it and I don't have all the information accessible, but I think it's just very cool to look at it. If you can select one dot, try to keep your eye on it and watch as it uh, moves. 
you can see that the colors change. So we're in red now, we're getting into December. And then uh, as, we, as the year starts over, we're in blue and you can see how it's all shifting back to the north. All of the information uh, that is gathered to create images and infographics like this are used from uh, various data collection um, methods like eBird, for example, or other bird surveys, Project Feeder Watch, um, all those great backyard bird count, all those sorts of things to help um, create models and uh, share this information in, a, in an infographic. So what is migration? I got some pictures here on the screen. And uh, if you'd like to take a moment and look at the photos, one of them you should already know uh, for sure, but maybe type in what you think they are, what species we have here. I think people often think of migration being birds exclusively, but uh, it's not just birds, obviously. Uh, we've got mammals represented here and insects as well. So Arabella, yes, thank you. We've got monarch butterflies uh, and caribou, yes, awesome. So those are two North American species that we see migrating. And the interesting thing about monarchs is, uh, you know, there's there's some, not disagreement, but, you know, conversation about the definition of migration because monarchs, a single individual is not flying back and forth. It's generational. They're kind of leapfrogging their way down south and then back up. So it's the, the butterflies that are here are not the ones that will make it to South America, or Mexico, Central America, and then back. It's going to be multiples down and back. And then at the bottom, uh, caribou up in Alaska. Other species, uh, uh, another mammal species are that no longer exist in a migratory way, but the American bison. And then a very, there's one other, well, I'm sure there's many others, but there's another terrestrial animal that migrates. And I'm curious if anyone might know what it is. There we go, Arabella, yes, salamanders. That is an awesome one that uh, are, is really cool to experience if you ever get the chance. I don't have time to explain all of it, but it's awesome if you ever get to experience a salamander migration. And they're not going that far compared to snow geese and you know, some of these other, uh, other animals. So migration is moving from one place to another, usually over a long distance, but that's relative. Lots of different animals do it, and it is a, it's an arduous trek, no matter the distance. A couple cool photos. So why do birds migrate? Or why does migration happen? In general, um, it's not because of temperature. If that was true, then we'd have no birds here. But we all know that we do in the wintertime. But we all know that we do have birds here in the wintertime because our feeders are full and there's lots of waterfowl to be seen raptors to be seen in the winter months in New York uh, or in the Northeast. And they have feathers to keep them warm, but there are some species of birds that are not uh, adapted to our cold temperatures. So a lot of our uh, insect eating species like the warblers here, this is a prothonotary warbler that we have, uh, we, we have prothonotary warblers regularly nesting within the Montezuma wetlands complex. I took this guy, took a picture of this guy, I think in June, they nest in a nest box about 20 feet off a road that you can stand there and there will be people lined up along the road. People are very respectful. It's also in the middle of a swamp, so that keeps people out <laughs> uh, a little bit, gives it some distance. And the bird is very, the birds are very showy, very cooperative, and it's awesome to, to see them because they're, they're more associated with like deep south. Then our osprey. Uh, so in my neck of the woods, we have the Finger Lakes and the big lakes do not freeze or they haven't frozen in like a hundred years. So. I'm talking like Cayuga, Seneca, uh, Canandaigua, um, but osprey aren't adapted to stay, even though we have open water uh, and they could fish because they only eat fish. They're not like an eagle that will eat uh, carrion or mammals um, and uh, birds and fish, but they will, uh, the osprey will only eat fish. So they leave because most of the time, a lot of water freezes over and they also are not adapted to the cold the same way that other birds are. So in general, migration is from an area of low value to high value. And that could be because of food, uh, breeding habitat, uh, maybe to avoid temperature. Uh, and so it's not just to do with uh, weather or season. 
there's a lot of different reasons that migration happens, but in general, it's from low to high value. So here are some examples of, uh, do all birds migrate? No, they do not. Here are some species. We, I'm sure you've all seen these birds before. Obviously, uh, some people were seeing bald eagles and you've got a lot of great bald eagle habitat down where you are um, on the southern end of the Hudson. We are, as a, we are another great place to see bald eagles, um, specifically not within the Montezuma Wetlands Complex at this time of year, but Onondaga Lake in Syracuse has had over 100 eagles, bald eagles at one time, including this year, uh, within the last couple of weeks. Usually the colder it is and the more that other water freezes over, Onondaga Lake, part of it stays open because there's a wastewater treatment facility on it and the effluent water is warmer and helps hold the ice back. So gulls and tons of water birds uh, tend to hang out there as well as the eagles. So um, wild turkey are considered non-migratory. They don't really, they do fly, but not well. They don't walk long distances, they do, but you know, they're not gonna head down to uh, Texas for the winter. They're pretty stationary. And then we have birds like cardinals and downy woodpeckers and black-capped chickadees and titmice that are all uh, year-round feeder birds. Okay, so danger, dangers of migration. I love this photo, the detail, absolutely beautiful. Ruby-throated hummingbird drinking out of, uh, drinking some nectar looks like from a trumpet vine. So storms, major uh, effect on migratory birds. This picture is what's called fallout. And if anyone has witnessed this before, I think it's a double-edged sword. For one, it's fascinating because look at all the species we have here. We have black pole warbler, we have black burnian, uh, let's see, oven bird, uh, common yellow throat, American red start. There's probably others that I'm missing, but variety of, um, a variety of different birds. So when we experience extreme weather, during migration, the birds just simply cannot handle it and they will fall out and they will land and ground themselves. This photo is from a uh, lighthouse, I believe in Massachusetts. Uh, and it was a phenomenon where there were hundreds of birds grounded. And sometimes, uh, you know, they could be hitting structures, windows, buildings, when they are disoriented in the storm. Uh, they become, you know, very uh, uh, vulnerable to predation and either by wild animals, domestic animals, humans, <laughs> unfortunately. And so this is, this is not good for them. And it is something that has happened naturally for eons, right? But with the changing climate, we are seeing more extreme weather happening out of the typical season sometimes. You know, uh, you know, a really late winter hard winter ice storm or something like that, uh, maybe in April when we're seeing a lot of birds starting to songbirds, especially starting to come through that could be be very dangerous for them. Uh, so there's nothing we can really do about this, uh, except get involved with climate change in a variety of different ways. But again, that's a whole other presentation <laughs> that uh, I could talk a lot about. Predators. So uh, cats are well known as being, uh, especially songbird predators, domestic cats. So the two most invasive species on this planet, number one, human beings, number two, the domesticated cat. We both have infiltrated almost every continent. I don't know if there are uh, domestic cats on Antarctica, I would hope not, but uh, almost every continent, human beings for sure. Uh, you know, upending the balance of things in, uh, in a habitat or disrupting the ecology. They kill millions of songbirds and mammals a year. And of course, there are other predators that are not considered invasive, right? But this is a pressure that didn't exist on this continent until human beings came here. So birds evolved for millennia uh, with pressures of native predators, other birds, other mammals, uh, disease, virus, things like that, and the strongest adapted and survived. But adding a pressure like domestic cats uh, is really uh, 
really detrimental. And it's such a touchy subject because people are so attached to cats, even if they're stray, even if they're feral. Uh, and it is job security for people who work <laughs> in the field of wildlife management because there's always going to be an issue with them. Reflections. So big windows, awesome for viewing birds from, but uh, you can see this looks like the world continues through this flat surface and birds don't have the ability to really um, understand that dimension sort of. And sometimes if your feeders are right next to your windows, which if you look in the reflection, I'm seeing bird feeder here, bird feeder here, maybe more, I can't quite tell, uh, but say something spooks the birds, they fly up in a, in a frenzy to get away and they're hitting windows. Uh, there are things you can do. You can hang the windows, you can put different stickers, things like that. You could put, uh, move your feeders away from the windows. You could put shrubs in front to help block a little bit. Uh, but it's, it's a difficult one because we wanna have big, beautiful windows to look out of, to watch the birds, but uh, not to their detriment. This is from uh, 2021, yeah, 2021. So this person uh, works with uh, Audubon, New York City, I believe. And uh, maybe you all are more familiar with me because you're from downstate, uh, but New York City is a death trap <laughs> for migratory birds. There's so many buildings, and not just New York City, many, many cities, many, not even cities, uh, residential homes, but you know, the likelihood of hitting a reflective surface in a city is much greater. And so hundreds of birds are found daily. Uh, I would hate to say thousands. I suppose that's, that's possible. And maybe it is. Maybe someone knows more than me. But it's, this is just from uh, a few buildings that uh, Melissa walked and uh, had a couple additional birds that are not shown. But uh, it's, it's really uh, an issue because, you know, having maybe a handful of birds hit your house window in a given year is unfortunate, but not enough to really make a dent in the population. Things like this, absolutely. This is just one day, one walk from a few building, around a few buildings, check, and you can see that the impact that it could have, that it does have. This is another really interesting uh, issue that has that has happened. So at the 9-11 memorial site, you know, on 9-11, the, the lights are powered on and they're beautiful. And I, I definitely agree with wanting to remember the people that lost their lives that day, the first responders, everyone involved in that tragedy in 2001. But look at all of the dust particles you see in the light beams here. Those are birds. Those are migratory birds. And they get trapped in these lights. So the bird people of the world or of New York City, uh, instead of lobbying or, or trying to force down the lights not being shown at all, there are people that will volunteer. And I would love to get involved with this one year just to experience um, both this, this fall migration and then also to be there at, at the site. Um, to experience the memorial, but periodically the lights are turned off to kind of release the birds. Um, they get disoriented and they get very confused. There are probably also insects attracted that may attract them as well, but I don't know how high the lights truly go into the atmosphere, but the birds are throughout the entire column that I can see here in this photo. Beachgoers, this is another uh, issue that you all may be more familiar with uh, than issues that I deal with up here in uh, Western New York, although we do have piping plovers re-nesting on Lake Ontario shore. So, and it, they are already causing issues. The birds aren't, their presence is. People love to spread out on the beach, bring their kids, bring their dogs, bring their games, um, have campfires and leave behind garbage either because they don't care or inadvertently something falls out of a pocket or gets blown off a towel or whatever. Um, and the birds that nest on beaches 
can't just go anywhere. That's not how they evolved. So becoming um, bird friendly beachgoers by giving them space, staying out of nesting areas that are marked, uh, advocating for giving them, being an advocate for giving them space and respecting them is very important because the piping plover, for example, is an endangered species. So they have recently, very few, but recently uh, started nesting on the eastern end of uh, Lake Ontario in a, an area where there's a gravelly bar, gravel bar that people like to beach their boats and hang out. And people are mad that they now can no longer do that. I've been doing it for years. I'm sure you have. And, you know, birds that have federal protection are considered that they have more weight than you do with beaching your boat wherever you want. So another contentious topic uh, that many people struggle to respect, but I know many others absolutely do respect give them space and help advocate for their safety as well. This is a program that um, Audubon, New York, and I believe Connecticut now share, but share the love, share the shore. Everybody can enjoy it. Human beings, despite what some of us believe, do not need to be everywhere we want to be. <laughs> we don't need to be spread out in every little nook and cranny everywhere. We can enjoy going to the beach and spending time at the beach without tramping all over very important nesting habitat. I'm going to quickly open the chat because I see that there's some waiting in there. Uh, okay, just going to see if there's anything. Yeah, okay. I see the concerns about the box. I'm going to try to drag it. It's just, yeah, I can't. I can't get it to go vertical. I'm sorry. I don't know, this has never happened to me. I've heard of this happening to other people with the, the blacking out of the box. Lucky all of us, it's happening tonight. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I still don't want to advance. All right, so how do birds navigate? Here's a photo I took of snow geese in recent years. So they use the sun uh, to help with uh, not only providing light so they can see during migration, but also as a directional. This is a flock of sandhill cranes flying through. Migration during the day is, let me see if I can get this to play. Uh, migration during the day, many birds like uh, raptors, will migrate during the day to take advantage of thermals. So those warm air currents that come and lift off of the earth. This is a video of uh, turkey vultures. And if you've ever heard the term a kettle, a kettle of turkey vultures or broad winged hawks are another one that are well known to kettle. This is a remnant from our uh, British or English heritage. Uh, so for some imagery, Folks thought that the birds roiling up and kind of bubbling up the, the warm air column and then boiling over and falling back down to start that, that process again reminded them of boiling water in a kettle. So really cool thing to see if you are in a good spot where there's uh, you're in a migration path or you're in a pinch point. Uh, for example, like along the Lake Ontario shore here, we have Braddock Bay, Derby Hill. Those are two spots. Um, Hawk Mountain in Pennsylvania. Uh, what is the one in Oneonta? It's Delaware Otsego Audubon Franklin Mountain, I think it is. These points are excellent to see migration happening like this. It just, say, it's like coasting on a bike. It makes more sense to ride the thermals and soar than flap, 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 flap. So we see a lot of this um, along the Lake Ontario shoreline because once they hit the shore, the thermals disappear over the water because the water is much cooler than the air temperature. So there's not that, that lift anymore. And the birds then have to decide, I'm gonna go left or right, east or west uh, to get around the ends of the lake and then continue on. However, there has been evidence of saw wet owls, I'm sure others, but this is just when I was talking with someone about um, saw wet owls coming directly across Lake Ontario. 
the smallest little guy ever. Pretty cool. So uh, many songbirds use uh, stars and the moon to help navigate. This is a map. If you don't know about BirdCast, look it up, find it. Uh, it's very cool. I'm going to move this so you can see the text at the bottom. Uh, and um, so this is a snapshot from when I gave a presentation in the fall. I wanted to update it so it was relevant to us, but this map would pretty much be blue right now because it's low migration intensity right now. It is slowly going to start building over the next couple of weeks and then it's really going to kick off once we kind of get into late March and then mid-April, you know, lots of different species are, are coming through. But on this night, um, October 7th, uh, last fall, this is what the map looked like. And you can see that the, the brighter yellow is the higher intensity uh, of migration happening. So down here in, um, oh, we got Louisiana, uh, Alabama, Georgia, Georgia, uh, South Carolina, what am I missing? I'm missing a state here. Mississippi, uh, around the Gulf here, so Texas, and then South Carolina, North Carolina, uh, over here, North Dakota, really, really bright. So this is a, a forecast of migration and it's really, really cool to see it change over time. Like as days, you know, you get into the season, kind of peak and then start to taper off. And uh, it's, again, just a really cool way to see imagery of this phenomenon of migration happening. All right, move this back down. So uh, yeah, the stars and the moon, they basically act as uh, a roadmap. They can uh, navigate using the constellations, the position of the, the constellations in the sky, depending on the season, depending on where they are latitudinally, longitudinally, uh, and many songbirds migrate at night. It is safer, perhaps, because they are a smaller, more defenseless bird, so under the cover of darkness, they can fly. It's cooler. Songbirds don't use thermals like birds of prey do, so they don't have large uh, surface area of the wing to help them with soaring, so the cooler temperatures help them from overheating, and the thermals don't benefit them anyway. And uh, I've never, I'm not uh, a nighttime birder, although I would be if somebody like dragged me out or really encouraged me to. <laughs> uh, and I've only witnessed this one time and it was just a uh, happenstance. I happened to be walking my dog late at night and it was here in Geneva. I live in a very residential area, but I heard a hermit thrush sing in the middle of the night, just a couple notes enough for me to know that it was a hermit thrush or excuse me a wood thrush i heard chuck 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 da 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 and then it stopped and i whipped my head around like is that what i think it was and then i heard it again it wasn't the full phrase it wasn't ongoing but it was bits and pieces of the song so here's a recording i hope you should be able to hear this i i uh, did turn on the sound but this is a recording from uh, some nighttime migration Many times you're not going to hear full songs like we expect that we, uh, you know, we equate with specific species, but a lot of more contact calls, uh, chirps, twitters, things that are just kind of alerting each other to each other's presence and probably communicating things that I don't understand. So let's listen to this. Anyone catch the owl in the background? Well, I heard a great horned owl in the background. Ooh, 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 ooh. And I couldn't tell you what the rest of them are. Maybe someone who knows much more about bioacoustics could uh, there, I'm, there are ways to determine different species. There are ways to determine different species of bats using the frequencies of their echolocation, uh, but that takes special equipment and uh, 
to be able to bring that frequency down to a range that we can pick up with our ears. Swainson's thrush in the mix, cool. That's good to know. Thanks, Ann, for sharing that. All right, let's advance. Why migrate at night? Well, like I said, you know, they're under the cover of darkness. It's a bit cooler. Uh, they don't have to worry about uh, maybe being as easy targets when they're uh, flying uh, during the day and they're not taking advantage or they don't, they can't take advantage of thermals because they're not adapted for that type of flight. So moving at night is a great way to do it. Oops. I think I went over all the, oh, to conserve water, that was another one I didn't mention, but yeah. Some birds follow other birds. Again, sandhill cranes here. So we all know the Canada geese flying a V, right? That's, that's what they're known for. Um, and other birds do too. Sandhill cranes are another one. Snow geese, uh, they do fly in a formation, but it's much sloppier and it changes shapes from W's to M's to U's to V's. Uh, but they do fly in a formation. Not all birds do, but um, some follow other birds because that is the way they've adapted to do that. It makes more sense aerodynamically, you know, that there's more slip when they fly in a certain way uh, that uh, there's less drag against them as they're flying, cutting through the air. Landmarks are another way that birds navigate. I love this photo. I, I have not been able to find the original photo. This is taken um, from engineering the Erie Canal website. This is, we are hovering over, we are acting like a turkey vulture right now, and we are soaring over the top of Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge, looking south along Cayuga Lake. Right here is the National Wildlife Refuge Visitor Center. This, I'm going to move this out of the way. This rotary here is the wildlife drive. If you've ever visited, that's the wildlife drive. This is the Seneca River here along here. And then this cut through here is routes five and 20. Auburn is over here, Seneca Falls over here. So love this photo. I, I um, have been doing a lot of reading and research about uh, cultural history surrounding the canal. That's a whole other topic. Again, the construction of the canal really messed up the hydrology of the wetlands. And, and even before that draining of wetlands, clearing of land for farming, uh, and so I was rooting around looking for some historical information and came across this picture and just absolutely loved it. Oh yeah, and the arrow shows where the center is. Okay, now this is a newer, uh, maybe not newer concept, but research is still being done. This paper was published, I believe, yeah, so January, I think of 2021 or maybe February of 2021, just last year, a year ago. Na navigation by extrapolation of geomagnetic cues in the migratory songbird. So magnetite, the, the olfactory and sensory system of a bird is not the same as a human being. We have, we share some of the same senses like vision, sight. Um, they, many birds do not have a sense of smell. That is an old wives tale. If you find a baby bird on the ground and you pick it up to put it back in the nest, the mother's not gonna reject it. <laughs> Turkey vultures are one of the few and maybe the only in our part of the country that have a sense of smell. And that's because they eat carrion. So being able to detect that smell will bring them to food. But um, birds have additional sensory that uh, allows them to navigate the world in a way that we are unfamiliar. Um, they have magnetite, it is believed, somewhere in their olfactory system that can help them determine north and south, which is just amazing because what an adaptation, right? Truly amazing uh, and something that is hard for many people to wrap their minds around because we don't experience that. We have nothing like that that is the same. We can hold a compass in our hand. I can turn on my GPS. I can open my, my Google Maps app on my phone, but tell me to get to Juneau, Alaska without a map, and I'm probably going to make it. <laughs> probably not going to make it. So we talked a few things already. What can you help do to help conserve? 
birds that migrate, uh, creating a year on habitat, which was already mentioned uh, before I began presenting, but you know, planting native plants that will provide year round food. So things that will hold fruit or seeds uh, into the winter. There are many great choices. And if you go to um, the National Audubon Society website, if you just Google plants for birds, you should be brought to the plants for birds section of uh, the Audubon website and you can type in your zip code and a list will be populated of plants that are um, hardy and native to your area that are beneficial to birds and other wildlife. So if you need a reason to not clean out your wildflower gardens, your native flower gardens in the fall, leave them standing because things like echinacea or purple coneflower, black-eyed Susan, things like that, they will hold their seeds through much of the winter and the birds will feast on that year round. I think people often wanna to be told what's the best bird feeder I can buy. It's plant native stuff that will really help them um, throughout the winter. Keep your domestic pets inside when you are not watching them. Yes, of course, dogs can cause damage to wildlife as well, but not nearly at the same rate that domestic cats do. Uh, you can put things up on your windows to help with uh, collisions against the reflection and then turn lights off. Even if you were just a residential home, if you have floodlights, uh, turn them off if you don't need to. If you don't need them, save electricity at night, you know, have it on a motion sensor so that it only turns on when there's motion. If you want it on when you pull in your driveway, it'll flick on when you come. Uh, but it's not just, you know, the World Trade Center Memorial site that is affecting birds, but think about stadiums, parking lots, floodlights, uh, lighting along like uh, expressways, airports, things like that. Very disorienting. Let me check the chat real quick. Okay, not for me. That's fine. I just want to make sure there's no questions that I am ignoring. I'm happy to take questions at the end um, as well. So uh, improving, creating habitat, this is our Plants for Birds program. So audubon.org backslash plants for birds. I know it's kind of hard to see it's small text, but there's the website. But again, you could just Google it as well. This is a group of students we had out from a school in Syracuse where they were helping to remove invasive species. Uh, I think judging by what they have in their hands, they have plastic bags. I think they were out hand pulling garlic mustard, uh, which is very prolific. And all these blue tubes you see have native trees or shrubs planted in them. And we, we put the, the tube around them to protect them from deer, uh, rabbit, squirrel, you know, predation, uh, nibbling on those nice tender little uh, seedlings that we just planted. And so we can kind of monitor them for a couple of years before uh, we removed the tube. Here's our plants for birds. Let me move this. You can see, I know this bar is annoying, uh, but lots of great information here about bird friendly communities, plants for birds, bird friendly buildings. And this is a beautiful photo of a ruby throated hummingbird sitting on looks like butterfly milkweed, one of my favorite natives. Oh, butterf yeah, butterfly weed, butterfly milkweed. Yeah, great. Okay, I don't know if you can hear my dog in the background gulping water because she needs to do that right now. <laughs> okay, ooh, 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 going too fast. So species of birds to be expected this time of year. And again, this is specific to uh, the Montezuma Wetlands Complex or the Finger Lakes in general, but probably some of it will be uh, applicable to you as well. So bald eagles, we see them year round in the Northeast, right? They are back. They uh, were on the brink of extinction. I, I have another presentation I do called Back from the Brink. Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge is where the bald eagle reintroduction began in New York State. We're very proud of that. Um, and so they can be see, seen year round, but these pictures specifically are indicating certain behaviors. Bald eagles are one of the earliest breeding species of birds in New York, the first being great horned owls. They are on nests right now, great horned owls, and eagles are or very soon to be. Uh, so you'll often see them even starting in late fall, early winter, beginning to really um, pair up and hang out together again. They do pair bond for life, but throughout the summer and into the fall, uh, they, they sometimes separate because they're done taking care of the kids. They're off, you know, spending time on their own. But in late fall, early winter, you start seeing them pairing up again, revisiting each other, maybe beginning some early courtship by vocalizing. The bird here in the lower right is bringing a branch 
uh, a large branch to a nest perhaps, maybe to show its mate, look what I got for you. I bought have this big branch for you. Aren't I a wonderful partner? Uh, so it's not just uh, the species to expect, but behavior as well. And if you just, every time you learn a little bit more about natural history, you can tell more of the story, which is interesting to, I think. That's why I became a naturalist because I love to look at what's around me and kind of get some ideas of what is uh, going on in the world. Falcons, we, you could see all four of these species of falcon, uh, not directly in the Montezuma Wetlands Complex, but very close. So the three on the right-hand side, absolutely. We've got our American Kestrel, our Merlin, and our Peregrine Falcon. Uh, absolutely, these birds we see uh, year-round. And I'm not gonna share specifics because the deer falcon is a sensitive species of bird, but we have regularly, for as long as I've worked for Audubon in this area, had a deer falcon visit a specific place uh, very uh, alongside uh, the west, west side of Cayuga Lake, regularly hanging out there in the winter times. And I know how special and rare it is to see a deer falcon, especially in the lower 48, especially in the Northeast. It's a common bird for us. Uh, if you know where to look and you have enough patience, people see this bird all the time. I went looking for it many times, dipped every single time, began to think that it was all conspiracy theory against me. <laughs> uh, and then one day I was at Cayuga Lake State Park boat launch, which is, as a falcon flies, only a couple miles from where it usually hangs out. And uh, I was standing there talking, we had, we had an intern on staff and I was bringing her around to some of the birding hotspots so that she could help people when they called or came in the center. And so I brought her down to Cayuga Lake State Park and it was, uh, I believe in January uh, last year. And we're standing at the boat launch and I remember being all bummed out because it was iced over. And I was like, darn it, I was really hoping to show you some waterfowl down here. Like I had a spotting scope, I thought it'd be really cool. So we're just standing there chatting for a minute and out of nowhere, I at first thought it was two mallards, but these two birds come screaming across the lake towards us. One was definitely a mallard because it was quack, 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 quacking. They kind of flew to our left and hit the bank. There was a whole bunch of like docks and stuff that were like pulled out of the water or were like sticking out of the ice, whatever. So they like hit the shore and I thought it was just two ducks coming in and were looking for open water and maybe hit the ice and slid and you know disappeared under a dock or something. So that happened and I turned around and I was like, oh, that was kind of cool. And as I said that, a bird pulled up in front of us and flew right in front of us. She was freaking out because she'd never seen a peregrine falcon before and she was super excited. And I was super excited because I, I don't like violence or gore like innately as a human being, but I, am, I love experiencing those National Geographic type of moments, like the eagle that got that Canada goose in that photo. Amazing, right? I feel for the goose, but I'm so happy for the eagle because it's so hard to be a raptor in the winter time. The bird landed in a tree. All I had was my iPhone. We had the scope, we were looking at it. It was so cool. I was still under the assumption that it was a peregrine falcon because I see them with much more regularity than deer, a deer falcon, which I had never seen in New York State. And we both left happy that we just saw this really cool thing. She got to add a bird to her life list, whatever. That night I'm thinking about it, I'm like, I don't, it just looked too big. It looked too light in color. I don't know, something about it didn't feel right to me. So I sent my grainy Sasquatch picture <laughs> to uh, some birders that, that have staked out this bird before and have gotten familiar with it. And right away they're like, oh yeah, that's a deer falcon. We were wondering if it had ever showed up around the lake hunting for ducks. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I called her and I was like, Jess, I'm really sorry. We didn't see a peregrine. She's like, oh, really? I already checked it off in my book. And I was like, well, check off to your falcon girlfriend because that's what we saw and amazing experience. So sometimes when you can't find the birds, they will come to you when you are unexpecting. Got a couple of Budio species of hawks. Uh, of course, the red tail on the right is a year round species, but right now we have rough leggeds. Uh, throughout uh, different grassland uh, agricultural areas and they are always fun to watch because they hover uh, and it's just something different than a red tail. No offense to red tail hawks, but they're everywhere. They're the most widely distributed raptor across North America uh, and rough-legged hawks we can only see in the wintertime. Some accipiter species, these are all year round and I I think, I do not remember, and there's not great scale with either of these photos on the ends. 
I'm gonna say the Sharpies on the right and the Coop, Cooper's Hawk is on the left, but I am totally open to being wrong and someone correcting me. I do know, I have the file, I, I, uh, the file names, I think when I was like putting the photo credits, it got layered behind the photos. It's on there, but it's disappeared. But the bird in the middle is a Northern Harrier, which is another awesome bird that I love to watch. Uh, a very busy bird that hovers and is so showy and fun to watch as it's hunting. Uh, and we do have them year round, but uh, they definitely increase in numbers in the winter time. And this bird I saw right from the wildlife drive is banded, but I could not, I, with all the pictures I took, I could not get a good photo or enough of band to tell anything. Cooper on the left, sharper on the right. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Got some owls. This photo on the left was shared with me a couple of years ago. Love that short-eared owl sitting on top of a uh, DEC wildlife management area sign. Uh, they are they are a regular visitor to our neck of the woods. Uh, very common in the winter time if you know where to look. Um, and I just love them. I think they have this beautiful like black eye makeup that really makes their their eyes stand out and very similar hunting behaviors to northern harriers. And they are. Both of these owl species are actually active during daylight hours. They're diurnal, so it's easier for human beings to enjoy them. The snowy owl, I just took this picture a couple of weeks ago, it was sitting on top of a roof at a uh, airport. And this bird was the most unbothered bird I've ever seen. It was one of those 20 degree days, but when you, there was no wind and we were standing in the sun and that bird was just soaking in the vitamin D. And occasionally, he would kind of not clack his beak, but kind of open his eyes, maybe a little bit, turn his head uh, or her head. I think this is a juvenile and I, I can't tell the sex of it, um, but the juvenile is pretty colored up. I was just totally unbothered by those of us who were standing there. I mean, it was on top of a building. We were standing quite a distance away. This photo is taken with like a 400 millimeters lens and then really cropped in, but totally unbothered. It was almost the person I was there with. He had never seen a snowy owl. And I was like, come on, let's go to the airport. And he kind of was like, whoa, this is so cool. And then within several minutes, like, is that it? <laughs> That's it. The shorter owls put on a show. The snowies are uh, a little bit more relaxed. Winter uh, songbirds love to see. This is three species in one photo. A friend of mine, Mark Miller, took this photo. We've got our... Um, long limb uh lap oops, oops, oops go back uh lap spurs here snow bunting in the middle and then horn larks over here they often hang out together in flocks like this i took this photo right along the side of the road recently and a lot of them a lot of them are snow buntings but i'm sure there are horn larks and long limb lap spurs in there as well and this field is a sunflower field so uh, they were flitting around in here. These are all, you can see all the dead seed heads that are on there still. Um, but they were, <clears throat> I was taking this photo from the road again, really zoomed in and cropped, but they were going between the road and gridding and then coming back up to the field and zooming around. There's probably 5,000 birds zooming around together, which was really cool to see. And this is often how you see them. Most of the time when I see snow buntings and, and the others, it's as they're taking off from the road and, and flying away as I approach. You, you really have to give them distance because they'll take off. Um, and so often you just kind of see them flying around in a flurry, but they're a cool winter songbird species. This is a year round bird, but another one that you can see in the winter time, maybe slightly easier just because there's no uh, <clears throat> foliage on the trees, but here we have our brown creeper. And I will point it out just in case you're having a hard time finding him. Here we go. Head is up here, tail is down here. They are amazing little guys. I love their song. If you can get their your eyes on them, it's really fun to watch them <clears throat> forage, uh, similar to like a nuthatch, uh, but just another really cool bird that is hard to see sometimes unless you've got patience and you're in the right habitat. And then of course we got our, our feeder birds that, that we see. Um, natives and invasives, of course, I have a starling in there. I do appreciate starlings for 
them as a species in Europe, <laughs> not here. I would love to see European starlings in Europe where they belong. They are a beautiful, fantastic, uh, smart, vocal bird. Doesn't belong here, but it uh, <clears throat> doesn't mean you still can't enjoy them for what they are. Uh, we've got uh, our American tree sparrow down here, another great winter visitor um, to our part of the state. And then we've got some finches, house finch, uh, looks like purple finch, or um, house finch, purple finches, I don't know, um, house sparrow. So uh, the normal guys that come to feeders, some more uh, maybe cyclical or eruptive species. We've got pine siskin, red-breasted nuthatch, purple finch, red crossbill, evening grosbeak, and common red pole. So hopefully you followed the order I went clockwise. Pine siskin, red-breasted nuthatch, purple finch, ro uh, red crossbill, evening grosbeak, and common red pole. Uh, I'm sure many of you are aware that last year was a major uh, flight year, eruptive year for the, uh, the finch species specifically in the Northeast. Uh, the Midwest is experiencing this, this, uh, this big eruption this year, um, other parts of the country, but, and there are some siskins and red poles. Purple finches are one that we see pretty regularly uh, and handfuls of these other guys like in the Adirondacks, especially are good places to see them. But last year they were journeying much further South into the United States. Uh, and that all had to do with the pine cone crop of the year. I'm gonna check the, Adrian, go to the South Central Adirondacks. My friend uh, has a camp near Pasico Lake and she took this photo and she like posts pictures as regularly as I could post pictures of downy woodpeckers. I hate her. <laughs> you just gotta know where to go. Love this photo because here we have birds feasting on uh, native um, plants. We've got our American robin that was feeding on a staghorn sumac. Again, I'm gonna go um, clockwise. Uh, we've got an Eastern bluebird eating, I think a shadbush, can't remember. Yellow rump warbler, the same friend that took the picture of that crossbill took this one and uh, I've been debating with people on what it was actually feeding on. Um, I was in a native plant group with this picture trying to get it narrowed down. I thought it was poison ivy. Other people were saying poison sumac. Uh, the branch it's sitting on doesn't look very viney to me. It looks like a thinner branch. Regardless, it's a native and uh, yellow rump warbler is, is one that can be seen in the winter months and makes sense that uh, as an insect eater that's gonna hang out where it's cold, you gotta switch your diet up and eat something uh, that you can find around. You got a yellow-bellied sap sucker there. Uh, so they are not drinking sap. They are drilling to make sap flow that attracts insects. They're setting little traps, that's pretty cool. Uh, another American robin, I just took this photo uh, recently um, at a state park and there were hundreds of robins eating on white cedar. It was amazing. So every time I hear someone say, oh, I just told my first robin for the year, I mean, spring's coming. I don't want to like shut someone down and be like, there's robins here all year round, but you can see the species of American robin year round in the Northeast. It might not be the ones that breed here. Uh, they do move around if the populations move around and mix a little bit, but American, and their behavior changes. Often people equate robins with pulling worms out of your yard. But if the ground is frozen and covered in snow, they can't quite do that. So they have to adapt and they love, uh, they love fruits. The sumac, the, the juniper, or the, well, it was the cedar. And then uh, we got our um, cedar waxwings here who are feeding on, looks like some kind of rose hips, something like that. Um, but uh, having this kind of stuff in your yard, you're, I'm not gonna say you're never gonna get a cedar waxwing at a feeder, but they're not a typical feeder bird. So, you know, it, it's hard to attract those kinds of things to your yard if you don't have the right kind of year round habitat that will attract them. So plant those natives and you may uh, have luck with getting some of the, some, some additional bird species that you might not see at other times. Let me just check the chat real quick. Okay. 
Uh, so we've got waterfall galore that's going to be pouring into the uh, area. We do already have quite a few redheads. We're seeing rafts of several of thousands. Uh, of course, other divers like canvasbacks, ringneck ducks. If you ever wonder, wondered why a ringneck duck was called that, it's because it's got this beautiful chestnutty color uh, that uh, is really only visible when you're holding the bird in your hand or you're at close range. So there's those birds that were named in the field at a distance, like the red-headed woodpecker. I have to have to believe that the red-headed woodpecker was seen first and the red-bellied woodpecker was seen second in the, in the hand and they could see that red belly. We, when I was in college, we were always like, why can't it be called a ring-billed duck? Because it's much easier to see this contrast. Uh, and they, they can look very similar to spop. We've got some spop here, uh, greater or lesser. Love this time of year. We don't have very many breeding waterfowl species. Uh, we have wood duck and mallard, some mergansers, um, maybe rogue species here or there, like several individuals. But for the most part, the ducks are going into the prairie pothole region, the Midwest. So Nebraska, Dakotas, Minnesota, Manitoba, you know, that part of the, the continent. And they're just swinging through because we have the Finger Lakes and amazing wetland habitats that they can take advantage of when they're migrating. And this is often a site you may see, mixed flock of all sorts of things going on here. I see mallard, canvasback, uh, scop, probably more, I can't, I'm not gonna take the time to pick out. Wouldn't this be a cool puzzle? An infuriating puzzle, but a cool puzzle. This is a photo I took recently um, from the north end of Seneca Lake where Geneva is located. This is mostly redheads. There's other things like goldeneye uh, common and actually a couple, at least one barrow goldeneye has been seen, scop, ringneck, um, hood and in common uh, and red-breasted mergansers uh, and gulls. There's some gulls in there as well, but this is only one small piece of the raft and you, there's hundreds of birds in this photo. Not waterfowl specifically, but gulls. This is a great time for us to look for gulls. Uh, you know, we're kind of limited on our gull species uh, inland. We of course have herring gulls and ring bell gulls, but um, in certain places like where I took this picture, you can see great blackback gulls and there's now far more, usually you can see one or two, but there's, there's far more now. Um, I think a Iceland gull was seen recently and who knows what other species could show up in there if you have the patience to pick through them all. Uh, here's one of the common golden eye, a female mallard, and then got a hoodie, hooded merganser. Let me move this. Hooded merganser here with uh, some common male and female mergansers. Canada geese, of course. Uh, never in my lifetime were they uh, in low populations, but I know that once upon a time they were in lower pop numbers of population and were maybe more of a treat to see. Uh, I know the opinion of many people downstate and on Long Island hate them. <laughs> they are messy, they can be aggressive, uh, they can take over parks and beaches and golf courses and parking lots. Uh, but when you see them in a place where they belong, like a wetland, it is really cool to see them. This is the pool right in front of the visitor center at Montezuma National Wildlife Refuge. And this day we counted, I think, 3,500 Canada geese, which was so cool. And there's some ducks in here as well. I think there's teal and shovelers. Maybe some pintail gadwall widgeon in here as well. This was taken back in October. And then the snow geese. So this is a video. I took this in March of I think 2018 or 2019. And uh, we see upwards of half a million snow geese at a time. To see 10,000 snow geese is very cool. And when I tell people, yeah, the big flock isn't here yet. We only are only seeing flocks of five, 10,000, maybe 25,000, their jaw drops. Like what, are you kidding me? That's not a lot. It is, but it's all relative, right? Because if you see 450,000 snow geese at once, it's dizzying. Sorry, I wanted to move that.
such a cool experience. And I will be talking more about that tomorrow evening uh, when I do my All About Smokies presentation, uh, talking about you know how to find them, where to look in our area. Um, I cannot tell you what day they're gonna be here, unfortunately. I wish I could, it saved me a lot of aggravation, but they don't let me know, so eyes to the sky. The photo I took uh, last year, or video, excuse me, uh, in March 2021. I was leading a birding tour. Everyone wanted to see snow geese. I was striking out, I couldn't find them, and then our last stop at sunset, we were rewarded and everyone thought that I was amazing and I was like thank god <laughs> if you've ever visited the area this is at um Knox Marcellus Marsh on East Road absolutely amazing some hot spots uh you know you're you're further away maybe these aren't helpful to you i did speak about some of these already but places where there's water especially open water um that's where the waterfowl are going to go that's where eagles are going to go uh and places and i mean you you're all from downstate so places that are like the hudson river and you know along the battery and around different parts of the like the waterways around New York City can be excellent birding locations. And we see the same thing on the Erie Canal. Uh, eagles nesting along the canal, lots of great water. But not this time of year, because a lot of it is frozen. But uh, once it opens back up, if it thaws out, it'll be a great place to look for birds and other, other great places uh, around the area. So this is the schedule, and I use that term loosely. Uh, of migration, at least in, in the Finger Lakes, Western New York. Uh, so waterfowl really seem to kind of be the first ones as a group, you know, like if I'm gonna generalize. Uh, and then we kind of have our raptors starting to really move in late March through mid-April. Shorebirds are showing up in April and then late April through mid-May, songbirds. And then of course, egrets and loons and other herons like uh, you know night herons or bitterns things like that they're all coming at kind of smattering of times um, but this is like a general timeline that I uh, kind of share with people if they want to oh what kind of, what's the best time of year to come or what can I see when I'm here right now and this is my information so uh, if you want to get in contact with me you're welcome to send me an email uh, I did include in the chat earlier uh, before I began presenting the direct link to our programs and events website but if you go to montezuma.audubon.org and just look for programs and events that'll take you to where everything is listed and I am working over the next couple of weeks to get my April through June schedule of programs up um, but I do lead in-person birding tours public tours but also book private tours so if you're interested in coming with a group of friends or just your family or just yourself and you don't want to be with anybody else I understand and we can plan a private tour for you um, and then we are also have a presence on Instagram and Facebook Facebook is probably the best way to know what's going on day to day I try to keep that updated with what we're seeing especially around snow goose season uh, to help try to cut down a little bit on the phone calls and the emails not that I don't want people to contact us but it really is in high volume that we get people reaching out asking about how to find the snow geese and sandal cranes is another one that people really want to come find. And this is the back of our Audubon Center in late July last year, standing amongst some invasive wildflowers, but also many native wildflowers. It was just beautiful. 